and welcome to Novell Customer Applications in Foot and Ankle. I'm Anna Zek with Novell, and we hope this symposium offers a new insight into our world of sensor technology. The Novell Symposium guests include Dr. Scott Ellis, Dr. Seiko Bus, and Dr. Robin Queen. Dr. Scott Ellis is a foot and ankle surgery physician at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. He runs a busy clinical practice, teaches and conducts research, and he is also currently appointed as an associate professor of orthopedic surgery at Weill Cornell Medical College. Dr. Seiko Bus is a human movement scientist and works as an associate professor, principal investigator, and as head of the Human Performance Laboratory at the Academic Medical Center in the Department of Rehabilitation in Amsterdam. Our third guest is Dr. Robin Queen, who is an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Mechanics and the principal investigator of the Kevin P. Granada Biomechanics Lab at Virginia Tech University. She's also a faculty fellow of Health Data Privacy at the Office of Vice President for Research and Innovation. Each of the guests have a unique perspective on sensor technology and how it can support clinical research in clinical decision-making now and in the future. I wondered if you could talk about what research into surgical techniques can pressure measurement support. You know, basically what we do is we take a whole set of patients that are normal, figure out what their plantar pressures are. And there's lots of ways to analyze that, and divide up the foot. And then when we do surgery, try to maybe not make it normal, but certainly normalize more the, the plantar pressure distributions on the bottom of the foot. And then you combine that with, um, you know, radiographic parameters, in other words, x-rays that you're looking at and a whole bunch of other modalities, one uh, being weight-bearing CAT scan that we're using more recently. And then you really just figure out how to optimize the surgeries that you do. A, a perfect example is in flat foot. The uh, way we treat these surgically is we reconstruct the foot by cutting certain bones and moving them over. Uh, and you want to understand how much do you cut each one, which bones do you cut, and, and the whole goal is to make the foot as normal as possible, which makes it feel and function as normal as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about, I guess, the evolution of technology available for your type of work? So it's interesting because the first study I did with plantar pressures, uh, interestingly, was about 15 years ago, uh, and I was a fellow. And uh, we were doing this interoperative uh, plantar pressure measurement system that we were developing. And, and uh, Martinus Richter is developing in parallel his own in Germany. Uh, and I had this plate that I would advance up against the foot and I'd used a, a, a different uh, plantar pressure measurement. It was almost like a thin piece of paper. And the outputs that I got were very rudimentary. Um, and it, it really, and it gave us just kind of some vague information, but as I, um, really understood and came to know um, Novell and actually in large part through Howard Hillstrom in our uh, gait or motion analysis lab, I understood just how much better the, the measurements that you could get, how much more precise they were. And then really it opened up to us to be able to really use them uh, in much more elaborate ways. And so I'd say that technology has improved and carried on not only to measuring plantar pressures in the operating room, but also in the floor of the motion analysis lab. And then even now we're doing it in what's called our um, gate simulator lab where we have a, a robot that advances a, a cadaver leg essentially up against a platform with this plantar pressure measurement in the it is it's, um, very precise the way we were able to measure the the, the pressures and so um, that kind of real-time data I think provides a better look at what uh, the pressures are in a real life situation and uh, watches it improve or, or actually get worse but usually improve over time. What do you see as the future of translation and research uh, in foot and ankle with load measurement? Technology has been huge for foot and ankle. It's a specialty that, um, you know, until recently was not highly popular and it was in its infancy in terms of its science and, and outcomes. But um, there's a number of um, developments in terms of uh, implants um, uh, and technology. I mean, the implant that probably comes to mind right off the bat is a total ankle replacement. Um, that has been uh, a game changer. And that's, you know, when I was a fellow probably 15 years ago, it was just coming online. But those patients with the total ankle, which is, you know, there were previous attempts, but not successful, but they're some of the happiest patients that I have. 
Um, another really exciting technology in total ankle is the ability to um, do CAT scan guided instrumentation uh, for um, patients so that you take a CAT scan before and you can really guide how you put that implant in. A couple of the exciting technologies would be, um, well, uh, plantar pressure measurements that we're using in combination with, um, you know, these, these other technologies and, um, you know, really helping us understand how the foot's loaded in space um, and then um, weight bearing CAT scan. So we have a a weight bearing CAT scan where you stand on it and you actually get a CAT scan picture to give you an idea of what it looks like in, in a static sense, but standing. Um, and we're learning so much about deformity and surgical reconstruction. In fact, a lot of these then come together. For example, um, I want to do a study now where we're looking at weight bearing CAT scan uh, where patients are standing on a plantar pressure sensor at the same time and understand the correlations of deformity with the plantar pressure measurements, because that's going to be key to help us understand how correcting bone deformity, for example, might normalize plantar pressures. And then I know it's a lot, but there's going to be a merge of all these different technologies too, that are going to really drive our understanding of foot and ankle. What has been the biggest challenge with diabetic foot care and also the technology that's been available? I have to think that there's been quite an evolution and advancement of that technology. Well, there's been definitely a development in technology when um, related to, for example, um, that we measure patients not only in the lab, but also outside of the lab. So with, with activity monitoring, for example, or we, um, we put sensors in the shoe uh, to measure whether they're actually wearing their shoe. So adherence. To, to treatment is a very, um, very um, important issue. But I would say that um, a major challenge, one of the major challenges is really um, how we can prevent these foot ulcers from occurring. So uh, the focus of the last 20 years has been very much on healing um, of foot ulcers in the diabetic foot. But that's a major challenge uh, because um, as soon as patients heal from their foot problem, like a foot ulcer, they think they're sort of really cured. So they can go back to old behavior and, and kick out their shoes uh, when they're inside the house, etc. cetera. And, um, and that's, well, that's, that's causing many of the problems. So when it comes to technology, uh, technology has been really helpful in, in sort of progressing this field. Um, look, taking pressure measurements, um, they have been very helpful in um, evaluating, but also improving the, um, the footwear that the patients have. By introducing pressure measurements, it's becoming much more a, a scientific and a data-driven um, sort of expertise and, and field. And we see the results from that because, um, you know, one of the primary aims of, of custom-made footwear is to reduce pressure underneath the foot because we know it's important in, in development and therefore prevention of these foot ulcers. We have all this technology now to better understand what the role of these different factors are in the sort of in the equation having you know, a clinical problem as outcome. And um, that's, I think, a development that is only going to further progress and, and give us more more data, more information, and preferably that would be data on you know, large groups of patients so we can actually do some more data science to better predict um, who's going to get a foot problem and, and who won't. The last thing I wanted to ask about was just the future of translation research in the diabetic foot, and if you could talk about that a little bit as well. Yeah, I think I think there's some very exciting things to do when it's about uh, translation research. It's it's um, um, for example, the, the an issue that I find very interesting is to actually see um, when a foot ulcer when it heals, there's a certain point where patients um, make the transition from from healing to prevention. So I would be more interested to dig more into the fundamental aspects of, of, um, of tissue healing 
And do you think that the sort of real world precise data that you would be able to collect will be able to help with that? So I'm really in favor of, of having having as, as much relevant and objectively obtained data from sort of out in the field, uh, from everyday life to, to use in this whole sort of decision-making about yeah, what to provide patients with and what for advice to give them. Also in terms of physical activity, because of course we know that physical activity is very important um, also for these patients. But at the, on the other hand, you know, it may also uh, increase risk of, of having uh, problems. So um, I would be very interested to see that, that we develop more into the, the knowledge on that aspect and can use that um, for decision-making in terms of what kind of therapy and advice to give patients. Can you talk about how this type of technology allows for that and allows for those type of assessments to be made? So we found that there's a lot of information that we can get in the lab that isn't readily available to our clinical partners. So our physical therapists or our orthopedic surgeons in particular is who I work with. We've begun using it mostly right now in our ACL patients in order to try and provide real-time feedback both to the patient, but then also to the clinician as they're looking to make decisions about readiness to return to sport. And then ultimately our goal is to be able to put it completely in the hands of the clinician so we don't have to be a part of it and allow them to be able to do that assessment at the point when they think the athlete is ready to go back into sport. Prior to us moving into to using wearable and mobile technologies like the load soul, we had to bring those clients or those patients to us which it, it, for us here at Virginia Tech means for some patients a 45 minutes to an hour drive to get to the lab for us to be able to begin the assessment. And then the collection of that information could sometimes take you know, upwards of an hour to an hour and a half, often because we were doing not just load-based measures, but also 3D motion capture. What the, I mean, some of the huge advantages of the low tool for us is that I can send either a graduate student or myself can go physically to the clinic and we can get those same metrics while they're either waiting for their physician or after their appointment is over and get and, and be able to provide real time and immediate information back to the clinician that would have taken us you know, probably a day, day and a half to process and get to them if the, if the athlete or the patient had come to us in a lab setting. What are sort of some of the components or elements of this technology to make the transition from research to a clinical influence clinical setting? The technology itself, I think that the biggest advantage is that it is wearable. We don't have all of the cables. We don't have all of the wires. It's not scary, so to speak, for, our, for a lot of our patients. So one of the projects that we've been working on is looking at biofeedback in, in some of these patients and specifically again in the ACL. And when we are able to show them, even just in standing, just when they stand there and they don't do anything, how asymmetric they are in terms of their load, it's an immediate conversation of, I didn't even realize I was doing that. Right? that it's that quick. And then we say, you know, have them do something very simple, like sit down and stand up in a chair or do a squat. And they start to see the, the fact that they are very much favoring one side over the other. It allows us to one, have a conversation about what they don't feel and sense. And then two, to be able to provide the feedback that says, now I want you to, to keep your load even. And I want you to look at this graph, right? We can project the graph from the load soul up onto a screen and say, okay, we're gonna go through some very simple squatting um, tasks and I, and I want you to watch and I want you to see what you're doing. And then here's what I want you to, to target towards. Prior to this, our targets were just so hard to be able to give them mm -hmm. anywhere other than in the lab, right? The fact that I can do this with them out on a field, in a clinic, uh, you know, in the training room means that, that I can meet them where they are and we can do those trainings and those interventions much more um, efficiently than having to get everybody in to see us.
<laughs> what do you see the future of this technology and its capabilities being? My hope, again, is that we can eventually put technology like this in the hands of the end user, of the athlete, of the patient, um, in the interim, you know, in the clinic with our PT, with our physical therapists and our athletic trainers, and, and be able to provide a mechanism by which they can talk to their athletes and patients about recovery and restoration of function. When we start to think about taking something like Load Soul and partnering it with eventually really good marketless motion capture, it, it's a game changer for us from the standpoint of when and how we can collect uh, and analyze information. Thank you so much to Scott, Seiko, and Robin for their time. And we certainly hope that you enjoyed the interesting insights and perspectives that they were able to provide. Mm -hmm.